Okay, so Mark here from Rock and Load. This evening, I am joined by the one, the only, Mr. Dr. D of Johannesburg-based industrial metal machine, Chaos Doctrine. The guys have just recently released a new track, a blistering 200 BPM track, Lifting the Veil. So let's find a little bit more behind this crazy-ass uh, South African metal machine, the doctors in the house. How are you, sir? I'm well in you, Mark. Thank you so much for having, I almost said us, me. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> you're, you're used to having your compadres beside you. You know, carrying some yeah, of the, the, yeah. They're, they've they've left you. They've all about. They've just abandoned you tonight. Yeah, since I hold the microphone in the band, I have to do all this too. You know, yeah, but it's cool. Yeah. I love doing this shit. So uh, yeah. here we are. Thank you so much. No, Always nice pleasure. to talk to someone in a very far away country. Exactly, exactly. The world is a weird and wonderful place now with technology, it. isn't it? You know, like literally everybody's at the end of the fingertips now, isn't it? It is. I did an interview with a guy in Rio yesterday, and I was like. Rio today and Ireland tomorrow. It is, it's fantastic. I just, I fucking love it. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. It is, it is. So look, tell us a little bit of history about the band. Am I right in saying you guys sort of formed back in 2011? Yeah, give or take, give or take. It was a long, it was a long build. Uh, Chaos Doctrine had a long journey uh, for two reasons. Firstly, the, the ever or never ending rotating band member syndrome that most battle bands have, especially past age 22. And secondly, and secondly, to you know, as as guys grow up and um, do stuff with their lives, they not everybody sticks to this. Um, and secondly, just to get our sound right, to get our technology right, to um, to get to what chaos to what we wanted chaos doctrine to sound like and be like, because we play industrial, the life setup is very different to most bands. We can't just rock up with a couple of guitars and jam. You know, we got samples running, we've got keys running, and and all kinds of programming happening. So we had to invest quite a bit of money and time in, in technology. So we started in 2011. Alec joined in 2013, um, who's our current um, guitarist. And then, um, yeah, we started hitting the circuit in about 2017. That's also when our first album came out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, as you say, there's quite, quite, a, quite a journey, even getting to the point where you guys felt you were ready to sort of unleash yourselves as a as a as a product because you know obviously if you're trying to nail down or hone in on a sound and and sell yourself that way then it's really important to make sure you have that that uh tapped exactly and all of us had been in bands before so we we knew what we wanted and we didn't want to go out there until we were ready with the full package you know yeah. when we play live we also <clears throat> you know there's a bit of dress up and uh, often we've got uh, screens with videos and all of this stuff takes time. So when you have a day job, you know, when we only have Saturdays and not even the whole Saturday to do this stuff. So a year is really only, let's call it 45 connect sessions, if you think about yeah, it. And yeah. to, to put out um to put out really powerful and and professional products in that time is quite difficult. I mean, we don't want to put out crap and then you know, people go, Oh God, here we go, another game. <laughs> Band, you know yeah 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 i'm so, 45 i'm 40 45 i'm 44 years old this year i can't be associated with garage <laughs> band anymore <laughs> <laughs> yeah well at least at least you're 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 happy enough to say your age on camera that's 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 I uh... <laughs> <give a shit>. <laughs> <laughs> Ozzy, i was born in 73 man <laughs> i know i know i know we, 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 we right. i know it's crazy we we covered um white snake there and like David Coverdale's in his 70s, you know, and to see these guys doing this at that age, fair play to them, you know, it's unbelievable. I know, right? I hope, I hope at 70 I can still walk, let alone fucking play, play shows. I know, it's crazy. <laughs> it's hard to believe, hard to believe. Um, yeah. So I'm going to assume then that you guys are perfectionists to a degree. Uh, if you've spent so much time, obviously, being so anal about the small details, the fine details of, of the stuff in the background, never mind the music itself. Completely. So um, we've we've had our own studio for a long time. Um, with our previous band configuration, we had a studio somewhere else called Subhuman Studios. And the, the guy who ran that left the band, that was our guitarist, Ray. And then we built our own one here, um, where I stay, which is a blessing <laughs> and a curse. Um, then when COVID hit, Alec had some free time on his hands. So he learned how to, to engineer and master. So again, blessing and a curse. Our previous album that came out last year, I think the the version came, that came out, some of the songs are like on version eight or nine, and not because of the not because of the song. We are very quickly, very quick at writing 
and and making a song and arranging it and doing that but when it comes to production we're just like we're painfully anal you know yeah like let's pan this voice not a 10 but a 12 and it, it's very painful and as we learn um when you're mixing 10 songs by the time you get to number 10 you've learned so much stuff that you're like hey let's go back to number two and <laughs> <laughs> what you did there. so so pain, painful yeah but i think the the cool thing about that is every product from us that comes out is better than the previous one you know what i mean yeah and that's really something that we're proud of yeah yeah um and like how do you guys like to sort of describe your sound you you you, you obviously have given yourself the freedom to um explore musically because obviously there's there's various influences coming in there and then in one song they can have everything from like a, a really groove laden slow track kicking oh, yeah. off and then it'll kick into something thrash you know and with industrial um elements in it so you, you obviously don't want to restrain yourself or be placed in any one box yeah yeah so if you listen to our previous album i think it gives you just a nice feel for let's let's call it our scope so yeah, we've got we've got a label which is industrialized thrash metal, which is quite accurate. Um, I do a lot of death metal vocal, but if you listen to the roofing, the drums, most of that to date is is really very thrashy. We have a new drummer now, Jason, and he's got a he's got a black metal background, so there's a lot of blast and stuff coming, which is really cool, you know, because it brings a new anger. But as you said, when you listen to that and a lot of our new stuff coming. Our scope is incredibly wide. We we like to do hard and fast, like Father Grigori, Black Friday, Bedlam, where it's just balls to the wall, thrash death metal, and it's angry and it's nasty. But we also have um, the right, which is like I I call it an ugly clutch ministry love baby. You know, yeah. Um, it's groovy. It's sludgy. It's clearly Black Sabbath influenced, and then at the end it just turns into a like death metal abortion. But we um we like to push our own boundaries the only rule that we have when it comes to writing a song is everybody in the band must like it we don't have a democracy there's no voting if everyone doesn't like it it doesn't fly so we did a depeche mode cover because we could we did a midnight oil cover because we could the lyrics are really odd it's all about places in australia anyway um so uh, we do we do what we wanna but i think even if you listen to the weirdest stuff we've done um, and the weirdest stuff still coming because our new album is bringing some really interesting bits. Um, still distinctly us, you know, which is really cool about, about being Chaos Doctrine. And I think it comes from the core three members of the band um, having been together since 2013. I mean, it's almost 10 years, you know, so we, we hardly even talk to each other anymore. It's more grunts and nudges, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the best way a band should be, really. Exactly. It's like only way you survive. Couple. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. And um, you were touching on, for example, the new music and the evolution of the sound. Um, I, I sort of sit and wonder sometimes when I listen to some bands and, and think like, how in God's name do they think of this? How does this happen? How does the song go from uh, that starting point to where it finishes? So like, uh, do you guys purposefully, purposefully decide, let's take this in a totally different direction? Or is it just something that sort of happens in, in the studio think, or naturally? Yeah both yes and so sometimes we are very deliberate and i almost want to say intellectual in our arrangement yeah um i can't remember who said this if it was john lennon or fucking madonna who <laughs> said your, your song has to go up and down up and down you know you that's um i love old school stuff from the 70s from the 80s songs go fast songs go slow and the slower it goes yeah the faster it sounds there um, so we're quite deliberate in our design often. So again, if you take something, even lifting the veil, if you just listen to the drums, the click beat is 200 BPM. It stays the same throughout the whole song. But sometimes it sounds hell of a fast and sometimes it sounds like we're dragging that thing back. And that just creates that dynamic in a song. So um, the design is intellectual, but the the composite or, or how we execute that design, that's just... I want to say creativity in the moment. So, um, uh, for example, lifting the veil, Phil and I did, Phil is our bass player and backing vocalist. Phil and I did that on New Year's Eve, on the 31st of December last year. We sat down, we whacked the riffs out, um, we, we programmed the drums. We didn't have a drummer then, so we programmed all those drums. And we were like, here's the song. 
So we gave it to Alec. Alec did the guitars. Um, I sat down. I did all the industrial parts in like a day. I did all the vocals the next day. And when we all got back together again, we were like, here's the song. And then the production started. So um, that one went quick. It just happened. Other songs is like two months of back and forth and left and right. Just to just to polish off those elements. So it, it really does depend. Let's call it intellectualized creativity, you know. <laughs> but there's definitely there's definitely design in the madness. It's never yeah. just a free for all in, in our band. We're quite deliberate and intentional about what we do. Yeah, yeah. And tell me about the industrial elements you were talking about there. So uh, what are they and, and how do you introduce them and what, how do you find the right fit? Yeah, yeah, that's... Uh, so if, if I have to unpack it, it's usually... There's the percussion parts. Um, so I, I, I lump this all together as the industrial. There's the percussion parts. There's, um, we, I call them noise loops. So little sounds and noises, not the doof and the clang, that's the percussion, but the little, you know, whoosh noises and swish noises and the yeah. like. Um, we use vocal loops, not in all songs, but quite often. Those are from movies or bits of stuff that we come across. <clears throat> and then finally, there's, there's keys. So the, the orchestral arrangements. In um, Lifting the Veil, there's only a little bit of orchestra. In some of our songs, like in Cult, it's pretty big. In others, they, it doesn't appear at all. Um, we usually try, you know, when we write a song, and I usually do the industrial parts by myself. I usually sit down and think, okay, well, what does this need? And then I overkill completely, like on purpose. That's my design. And I go back to the guys and I'm like, okay, here's what I did. And then we, we take out. You yeah, know? yeah. So if you go back to some of our old stuff, um, on our first album, you'll find Incubator. It's Luke to shit. It's like industrial as fuck, right? Where um, on our last album, you'll find Blood Serpent God, which we did with Anna, Anna Hell from Russia. And um, there's hardly any samples. There's there's like some chanting and a bit of looping, but there's no industrial percussion. There's no keyboards. So it really it really depends what what the song needs, you know. But yeah. lifting the veil, I went all out. It's it's crunchy, it's heavy, it's angry, and I wanted to just like you know put Al Jurgensen on on steroids and shove him into our song. Yeah, yeah, because it, it must be hard, as you say. There, um, you can either go full out and go really pack it all with stuff but it's also allowing the song to breathe sometimes and, and yes. knowing when to take stuff back out as you say yes and that's the biggest challenge of doing what we do um i mean alec is a fantastic guitarist and he comes up with amazing shit but sometimes we have to go dude like you know tone that shit down because yeah. in this we only have that much space let's let's have this little loop or these keys at the same time we have to go daniel can you try not fucking put keys in every second of the song because you know we need a bit of vocals and a, a bit of drums and some other stuff too so hitting that balance is, is sometimes really really hard sometimes it's easy and other times it's also you know it's like your baby if i spend two days doing something i want you to hear every single fucking noise and you just can't um in in music production you reach a point where that second is so full that that things just disappear and, and it takes away so Sometimes less is more, sometimes more is just the fuck up. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. So yeah, it, it's it is, a tricky it, process. Yeah, it's a crazy balance, isn't it? I think until maybe people uh, people on the other side, maybe who are just listening to the songs, would never really fully understand what it must be like in the mixing process, because yeah. obviously guitars will sit in a certain register, drums and bass will sit in different yeah. registers, and then if you're adding those elements in and out, it's just, it can be clusterfuck, as you say, really. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I mean, just something simple like the tone of the guitar. Um, what, what a lot of people don't know is the crunch you hear in modern metal is not the guitar. It's the bass guitar. You take the yeah. bass guitar, you duplicate the channel, and one of the channels is distorted as fuck. And the guitar is this thin little layer of icing that sits yeah. on top of um, even just balancing that is hard enough, right? Yeah. And now um, we come in, we shove in doof sounds while the while the drums are playing double kick and the snare is going fast, I want clangs in between and keyboards and some dude saying this is genocide. It's it's quite quite a mess. But, uh, we seem to have gotten there with lifting the veil and, and hopefully we're getting better at it, you know? Yeah, and, and for, as far as, say, lyrical content, do you tend to work on certain themes on an album or they just come as it, as it goes? Um, I usually go with with what the music 
feels like first i i write let's say 99 percent of the lyrics um so i go with what a song feels like and then i'm like okay like what do i want to do with this and obviously the angrier the song is the more hate i need to spit out in that thing because this is metal i'm old school dude for me um i come from the school of slayer um you know the more times you can say kill and hate in a song the better yeah <laughs> I'm, I'm being deliberately facetious but our, our, our lyrical content is still very much old school metal it's about war and genocide and death and death and death and satan you know not really satan but you get what i mean <laughs> so so i I'll, with, with lifting the veil i wanted to do something special um it's got angry content but i also i like i like putting a little bit of intellect in, into my lyrics every now and then if we do something like father gregory or um, or the right, I'll go and do research about my topic and I'll, I'll convert that into a song. But something like Lifting the Veil, I just sat down and I nailed it, bend it out. So what that song is about, if you take the concept of the Crusades, where the Catholic Church said, just go kill those people because they're not us. You know, that's what they told us it is, the Holy Wars. Um, if you take that concept and then you take the concept of a cult leader that's like you know shoot at those folk because they're threatening us and you mash those together what you get is a mega cult leader who, who sort of drives genocide so if you if you can hear my lyrics because it is death metal after all <laughs> that is that is really what lifting the veil is all about yeah you yeah know? yeah and, and that's one of my favorite themes that the whole like you know yeah, mind, yeah. you know brainwashing people stopping people from thinking for the from for themselves and the like well sadly it's a it's a very very relevant topic within this modern world isn't it oh yeah oh yeah yeah, yeah i don't know if it's more i don't know if it's more than before somebody asked me yesterday in an interview are we lying more than our parents and my answer is no but the same people who lie to our parents are the same forces that lie to our parents are still running the world right yeah. Yeah. And that's not a conspiracy. It's the Roman Catholic Church. It's government. It's blah, 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 blah. So we are supposed to be more aware because we've got more information, but we also have more lies because yeah. Facebook and, 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 you know, just spouts more of the same crap. Yeah. And information overload Still. almost. Yeah. 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 Just, just too, too much coming at us at the same time. And like, literally you can't see the wood for the trees. And, and nobody yeah, what knows. is the truth? What yeah. is the truth? You nobody, know, nobody I knows mean, anymore. If you just you just follow the sad COVID saga, what is mm. the real truth of anything of that? You know, yeah. nobody yeah. will ever know. And it's all fucking people jumping on their soapboxes and having grand scale opinions. When all you have to do, all you have to do in life is go, this is what I believe for me. You do that. I do this. And we, we're all fucking happy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's very it, it, simple. It's almost like a bit of a people want a nanny state where everything's going to be looked after for you and you're going to be mollycoddled. But the reality is the world isn't like that and you have to take responsibility exactly. for yourself, you know. But countries that are like that, like Sweden and Norway, where the government is so up your nose the whole time, those guys are complaining about something completely different than us. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. I mean, if on, on the surface living in sweden except for that fucking horrible winter which is i guess not that much worse than yours um living in sweden is bliss you know um everything is free and i say everything in inverted commas because you have to come to south africa to know what i mean um and yet if you listen to the metal that comes from there it is so fucking hateful and angry that obviously that there, there is something wrong so yeah. you know always think I was, you can't have metal from a country that's well, that's happy. And uh, I think Scandinavia is telling us something about that. Yeah, like what, what is happiness? You know, what's the definition of happiness these days, for God's sake? You know, it's, exactly. uh, it's, it's, all, it's all relative. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And so tell, tell me about your the lockdown experience then within South Africa. So did, what did you guys get up to then during that period? We, we did it sort of would allow you freedom to breathe or did you get the head down and put your yourself we to had yeah as far as i know we had the worst lockdown of most countries so complete lockdown um to go to work you had to have a permit and only essential services were open meaning banks hospitals police anything yeah. that need that the country absolutely fucking needs 
during that time, alcohol and cigarettes were not sold for, I can't remember the exact duration of time, probably three months. Wow. We weren't really? allowed to buy cigarettes or alcohol. You weren't allowed to go outside of your house, grocery shopping, one person, you know, almost in a biohazard suit, almost that bad, but not quite. And it was just ridiculous. And then it, we kind of went through the ups and downs with the rest of the world, you know, lower yeah. restrictions, yeah. higher restrictions, lower restrictions, higher restrictions. Um, I've, I was fortunate enough. I work in a corporate job and we just went remote working. So it didn't really affect me negatively. Um, for me, I've been home since, you know, March, 2020 and I love it. Um, my studio was just built. So I just walk like five meters that way. And I'm, I'm in my studio. There's a band in there right now. Otherwise I would have, I would have done the interview there. I'm in my house. Um, keep the noise down but, guys, keep the noise yeah. down. <laughs> yeah, keep the noise down. But the, yeah, the other Oaks, the other guys in the band took quite a hard hit, you know, they couldn't yeah. work during that time. It worked out for the band because Alex suddenly had all this time on his hands to learn to be a sound engineer. But it's still, you know, from a grown-up life perspective, it was a hard hit. But we're we're recovering as individuals. As a band, it's like it was a blessing. It wasn't it wasn't a bad thing for us at all. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting talking to different different musicians because everybody's experience of this the last couple of years is so different, obviously. And um some people were hit really personally on a on a, on a mental health level or just even knowing people that maybe did suffer throughout the pandemic so it's it's weird um and even coming back into the live scene now like are you guys back again playing live yeah yeah yep. we've played we've played quite a couple of shows we played um in 2020 i think we did not many but a couple three or four last year we played four or five let's say and this year we've done one. We did one last weekend on the 7th and we're doing another on the 16th of June. So we've got no restrictions at the moment. So the yeah, live seat is, is completely open. You know, we had curfew of like 8 p.m. and then 10 p.m. and then midnight and eventually they killed curfew completely. But I mean, even when we had a 10 p.m. curfew, we had a couple of shows. Getting home by 10 p.m. is really hard when you're in a band though, because <laughs> you have to be <laughs> off stage at nine to back up your gear, you yeah, know? Especially with all the shit you guys use. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we use more shit than most bands. So uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I have a truck. <laughs> and, and what about the international scene um are you seeing international bands coming through south africa again yet well we haven't we haven't had international bands here in quite some time um big bands in a horribly long time yeah. um uh, we're hoping uh, there's a couple of shows coming with let's say small bands there's a band from switzerland coming in november i'm told um but smallish bands you know not like not like big names the last the last band that came that I'm aware of, big band was probably Guns N' Roses. And that was your end of 2018, yeah. if I'm not mistaken, maybe 2019. No, 20, end of 2018. And am, am I right in saying, or am I, I'm just assuming, but is it harder for bands then to get to South Africa, like the, the major international bands, like American bands? What, what sort of route would they take to get to South Africa? Usually, usually, as far as I understand how it works, is a promoter from our side, um, the bigger bands, have a promoter actually has to get in touch with the band's management and then book them, pay stuff up front. Yeah. So um, I think the hard part is not on the international band side, but on our side. Yeah. Um, you have to invest a lot of money. Also, we have a really weak currency. I mean, rent to pound now, I don't even know, is probably 20 rent to dollar probably around 14 15 so you can imagine if you're talking about a let's say a slipknot mm. and they are charging a hundred thousand dollars you can imagine what that does you know we're talking you could have bought a house and a car kind of yeah you know and yeah. you don't know yeah. if that money is coming back so um the big promoters in our country usually don't get behind metal we had iron maiden out here i don't know five six years ago and it was huge but i mean iron maiden is huge yeah um, so that kind of scale will make you money i think as soon as you start making it smaller and more extreme metal guys are really scared that they're not going to make money a lot of people have lost a lot of money even on bands that you and i think wow like behemoth you know yeah, yeah. um 
people lose money just because of all the intricacies of currency, of travel, of hotels, of what, what, what. Also, South Africa is fucking far from the rest of the world. Yeah. You know? yeah. So we had ministry come here. Ministry was in Australia and they were heading to America or South America. So they figured instead of going across the Pacific, they'll go across the Indian and the Atlantic and hit us for one night. And that's how we got them here. You know what I mean? If it's yeah. not random like that. Yeah, which is good though, because although, yeah, bands go to Australia, but they usually go like Japan, Australia, South America, back home, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And we're, so we're in the middle of nowhere. Where where would they tend to play then if they get the larger international acts through South Africa? In South Africa, Joburg, most of the time, sometimes Johannesburg and Cape Town, if it's yeah. big enough, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. Very and, rare would they go to any other of the cities because Joburg and Cape Town are really the big metro metropoles, you know. And do you, the likes of the local promoters, would they put or, or sort of try and insist on having a South African band on the bill as well? Yeah, yeah. With all the bands we've had, there were usually some kind of South African opening acts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so tell me about then the music scene within South Africa for you guys, because obviously you are quite a niche um, so like, uh, yep. where do you get the opportunity to play and like, how far do you have to travel to access venues? Well, we, we, the, the, let's call it extreme metal scene is, uh, it's tiny, but it's developed enough to have, you know, multiple bands playing. So we play with bands that play death, slam, groove, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, and that's usually the kind of bands that stick together. There's also some alternative -y, punky kind of stuff glam, you know, whatever. And sometimes there's crossover shows, which I really enjoy because different fans see different things, you know, which is yeah, pretty yeah. cool. Our scene is really small. A lot of venues took a big hit during COVID. So a lot of them closed. Some of them are reopening. For us, because we're sort of just outside of Johannesburg City, it's rarely that bad to travel. Like we played a show last week which was on the east of Johannesburg and we are in the west. So it took us about just under an hour travel. And that's like an extreme example. Sometimes we'll go to Pretoria, which is north from here. That's about an hour's travel. But most of the time, the one one venue most of us play at is 10 minutes from my house. So, that's you know, not too bad. Really, really it's <laughs> like seven minutes. <laughs> I could walk if I didn't have a car or if I was drunk enough. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, no, I know my friends in England travel much further than I do. So I won't complain too much about that. Yeah, it's surprising. I had to sort of assumed that you'd be traveling hours to get to uh, another town or another province, you know, for a gig, because uh, obviously the Mar America, for example, you know, musicians are traveling, yeah. you know, state to state and even traveling from one state to the next could be three to four hours just across the state. Never exactly. mind. Yeah, it's crazy. You but know, because, the scale. Yeah, because we're in Johannesburg, we don't. Yeah, um, we've got. I mean, there's a band, for example, from Durban called Truth Decay. Durban is about six, seven hours drive from here. So they played here last weekend too. So they had to drive seven hours to get here with their gear. Yeah. Uh, we want to go to Cape Town next year. That's a 12 hour drive or two hour flight, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, South Africa is also much, much bigger than people know. They think we're this little, we, we've got space. You know what I mean? The yeah. north to the south is probably a good 20 hour drive if you go from way north from here to way south from here so we're not yeah. america by any means of i mean we're smaller than texas but we're still bigger than most european countries yeah it's crazy it's crazy to think crazy to think yeah and uh, what do you think of yourself of the, the the future of the south african metal scene then do you, do, you have, do you have good hope for what's what's coming out of it yeah i think i mean what what we can hope for is that the scene grows and not just organically but that you know it just gets alive a little bit, at least every now and then. So we do have some shows where there's great turnout, um, but those are sort of few and far between. Right now we're seeing it because we think people are hungry for it after COVID. But um, when you have smaller shows, less bands, usually your turnout can sometimes be quite bad, you know, kind of like your girlfriend and your friends are there and <laughs> bands watching each other. But yeah, most of the time it's okay. I guess it would also be, I mean, all of us as South African musicians hope for some kind of exposure to the North, you know, whether yeah. the North is Europe or the States or even Asia, some parts of Asia. I think our sound, Chaos Doctrine sound, is prob will probably land better in, in the greater Europe than it would in the States. Um, 
but uh, I mean, bands like, or, or countries like Germany are very much bigger on the on the more industrial scene. But then we also take that a bit further than than Rammstein, for example, where we're a touch heavier. So, you know, you never know. You never know. One state in America has more people than our entire country. So you yeah. can have a whole career in one place in the States, you know? I know it's true. It's true. It's and w- what about um, the opportunities for likes of um, international festivals? Do, do, you, do you ever see an, uh, the South African bands getting the opportunities to represent? Actually, yeah. Our guitarist, Alec, plays in another band called The Drift. So they're actually playing Vakken in August, which is pretty, okay. pretty cool. Obviously, we're hoping that, um, you know, he's going to shake down the, the right people to get us there. But something like that would obviously be fantastic. Something like Hellfest in France or, yeah. you know, obviously Viking is the Holy Grail. But there's so many other giant festivals that we would love to play in Europe if we ever got the chance, you know. Yeah, yeah. And just looking forward then, I know you guys, you'd mentioned, I think, in a, a scene in a previous interview, you were talking about maybe releasing a double EP this year, but you're now going to concentrate on a new album instead. Is that right? Yes, yes. So we, because we do industrial, you, I mean, you'll also know Rob Zombie and, and Trent Reza and guys like that and Al Jurgensen. they just love taking their tracks and doing different stuff with it. So we did that with our first EP in 2019 and we just sort of, 20, was it 2019? I can't fucking remember. Um, release some alternative versions. So while we work on songs, every now and then I sort of get a beer in my bonnet and I go and I remix something. So we were going to do that um, this year, bring out a new double EP because we've got enough material for a for a double EP. You know, demo demos and like the Russian version of Father Grigori and yeah. um, the version of Blood Serpent God that doesn't have Anna of Hell on it. You know that kind of stuff. Um, and then when we we finished lifting the veil, I was like, guys, we've got nine new songs done, and um, there's a special version of the right that I want to do. Let's just slap this on our next album. Let's let's go there. You know, we'll do the EP later. I love new new music, as much as I love new old music. So uh, yeah, we 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 started toying with the idea. We really dig it. So hopefully by the end of this year, if our OCD, um, you know, anal compulsions don't stop us from doing it, uh, we'll we'll have a new album out by the end of the year. Yeah, very good, very good. As you say, it's it's just trying to find the time, isn't it? Juggling everything yes. else, and and sometimes there's just too many creative ideas going on at the same time. Exactly. You have to rein them in. And I mean, when you're in a gig cycle, um, you're preparing for shows. Our new drum is learning our old material. We're writing new material. You could spend a whole day just you know jamming and learning songs. So we've sort of come into a, a discipline of having roughly two hours of mixing, two hours of playing three hours of drinking <laughs> in that in that order we don't drink and play we don't drink and mix we learned that the hard way um <laughs> otherwise otherwise literally a month goes past you didn't touch any of your production you know but every now and then we'll take all saturday and we'll just be like whatever you know anything goes today we have to sort of let loose and just have a good time too so it doesn't start feeling like a job yeah, yeah. And this, the songwriting process for the likes of the new music, do you, do, you, do you like to set aside a block of time and get together to work on it? Or do you just let it happen sort of uh, etherally? Yeah, the last the last couple of songs sort of happened organically, you know, mm. or, or a combination of like lifting the veil was deliberate. I said to Phil, come to my house that day. We are writing a fucking song, me and you. And we're not leaving the studio until it's done. Um, where some tracks... Literally, we're, we're at band practice, and while I'm switching on and plugging in, Alex starts jamming a thing, and I'm like, hold on, and I record that on video, and we save it. So we've got a song on our new album called um, Heretic, which is another, like, thrash death. Like, it's, it's horribly fast and ugly. But um, that came about from three videos that I made at three different times, and we took the riffs mushed them together, wrote little in-between pieces, but the main song was really written in between, you know? So I like that that organic process. Alec also digs jamming with the drummer. So now that we have a full-time drummer again, you know, he can come up with riffs on the fly while the drummer is tuning his, his snare and his kick, you know? So that's that's really, really cool. Yeah. And the idea, for example, when you said you, the guy come over to the house, we're going to write a song. Do you think, do you like that element of pressure to get something completed? Does it, does it, force you through sort of the, the glass ceiling yeah we don't we don't do that often because it can be quite frustrating if you don't come up with something yeah full and i have done that twice and we pulled it off the last time was about three years ago 
<laughs> and this time wasn't the same, but so we'll probably try it again in about two years time, you know, yeah. it is fun. It is fun, but it's also, it can be quite dangerous and frustrating, you know, yeah, yeah, of course, what we of course. do is like, I can play a bit of drums. So I would be behind the kit and just be jamming something and he could jam around. Um, it also depends what, what the two of us listened to in the, in the two weeks before that, you know, mm. I think Phil was listening to day aside when we wrote lifting the veil. So there's some seriously old school death metal going on in there, you know, yeah. and then I would be like, okay, now take that riff and take out the last two notes and leave it blank. Okay. Now take that one and play it this way around, you know, and that, that's how we sort of mold something in, into something original and fresh. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. And yeah. and um, so, what what's on the cards for you in the next couple of weeks? Then what have you got lined up for at the moment? Well, we have a show coming up. Sixteenth of June is a is a public holiday in South Africa, so we we're playing a big show at a club called Sonage, which is in Randburg, um, about uh, let's say fifteen minutes, twenty minutes from from where I stay in the west of Joburg. We're playing with four other South African bands, so that's super cool. Um, new drummer learning old music from the first album because we want to bring back some old songs into our live set. Um, yeah, finishing the third album and um, writing new music, hopefully at some point. Brand, 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 brand. New, which yeah. would be super cool, you know? Good, good. I'm glad to hear it. Glad to hear it. A lot of Look, fun stuff going on. Good man. I'm glad to hear it. Yeah, keep yourself busy. It's all you got to do. Keep the head down. You just, just keep yeah. on doing it. Yeah, it's exactly. All, all you, you need a hobby, for. dude. <laughs> exactly exactly a, keep you off the streets and out of trouble <laughs> yeah and, you know out of, out of out of the opium dens exactly exactly <laughs> well look uh dr d i will leave it there look uh, thank you very much for your time today oh thanks thanks to you mark thanks so much for supporting man it was really nice talking to you not a problem we'll talk to you again down the line you have something new and exciting uh lined up i'm sure there'll be something down and uh, not the too far distance future anyway you guys keep yourself oh, okay. busy all the time oh so look, yeah yeah we like to have something new every couple of months you know keep people yeah. on their toes and interested absolutely absolutely so look once again big thank you to dr d chaos doctrine uh check the guys out one of the the, the craziest bands out of south africa at the moment thanks again man pleasure talking awesome. to you Mark, have a good evening, buddy. You too. Thanks, mate. Take, Take care. care. Cheers. The